Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone from anywhere you are joining us. Thank you so much for participating uh, in this entry of TinyML Talks. Today, we will have Mithun Das and Shashirika Das to be here with us to share about how a middle school grows up a real life challenge using TinyML to uh, by a project gas leak detection. I, my name is Lily from C Studio and Chai Hua Make Space, and one of the organizing committee of Tiny ML Shenzhen Group. I am really honored to be here to moderate today's Tiny ML talk. We would love to send all our Tiny ML talk strategic partners, Aon Device, Arm, Deep Light, Edge Impulse, Amazon, PhotoHub, GreenWaves Technology, Gravity Inc., HOTG, Imagine Mob, Etermers, KeyCartag, Lantern AI, Messing Integrated, Micro AI, MSP, Prophecy, Qualcomm, Quizzle, Re Reality AI, Renaissance, Re Reason, SAP, uh, Seed, Sensio MLs, Sony Semiconductor Solution Co Corporations, ST, uh, String Analyze, SynSense, and Citation. And then one reminder for our upcoming TinyML Summit 2022, it will be a in-person event. And at the same time, we will also have our TinyML Research Symposium. It will all take place on March 28 to 13 in San Francisco. So if you are interested, please, please scan the QR code to register. And then also a reminder and also spoiler for our next TinyML Trailblazers uh, series. For this uh, episode, we will have Eric Pan, the founder from C Studio and Chaihua S Factory to join us to share about how C is uh, devoting to contributing to support the growing oh, wow. community of TinyML. And then also a background information for all of, of you, please feel free to join our growing TinyML communities all around the world. Uh, you can join us in the meetup groups and in also our TinyML communities on LinkedIn, where we have gathered like more than 10,000 members from all over the world. And then also, one more like tips about our growing tiny ML Shenzhen community as well. You can also join to our Shenzhen, uh, tiny ML Shenzhen groups on meetups. And then also we have a WeChat group. And then most importantly, we are calling for speakers for our upcoming tiny mails. So if you wanted to share your TinyML projects or your TinyML uh, journeys with the global community, feel free to scan the QR code to apply to be one of the speakers. And then also a shout out to the organizing team for the TinyML Shenzhen group. Uh, they are coming from uh, C Studio, Chaihu Make Space, and Moss Cloud. And then for today's talk, it will be recorded and then we will upload it to our TinyML YouTube channel where you can check all the talks that we have for the past and then including these videos as well. And then uh, a reminder for our next TinyML talks. So on April 5th, we will have Daniel and then Marcus to talk about Autofloat, an open source framework to automatically implement neutral networks on embedded devices. So uh, please subscribe it and then if you are interested. So now with, uh, without any uh, further ado, let's meet today's speakers. First, let's meet uh, Mason. Mason mm -hmm. is a distinguished software engineer and co at cost automotive with 70 years of experience in software he is also an ambassador at Edge Impulse and Belena. He obtained a bachelor degree in information technology from ESAS, India. And at course, 
innovation is in their culture, which brought Mason to the world of IoT. For the last four to five years, he has been working on IoT and machine learning for good. And then he has implemented many proof of concept, including low cost contract tracing, small parking, reducing carbon emission, saving peatlands using tiny ML, small colorful elephant, and healing substitution using haptic feedback are few of them. And then uh, the high the the the, free, the 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 spotlight of today the that's me Shashirika. Shashirika is a sixth grade student at East Line Middle School in in Connecticut, USA. She is really passionate about Internet of Things and programming, and then she participate in virtual contests such as the coolest project, Do Your Bit. She has started learning tiny ML recently with guidelines from uh her father mission and then he she created proof of concept of some of her ideas so now uh Shashirika, the floor is yours that's welcome all right thank you very much so as you know my name is Shashirika das i'm a sixth grade student in eastland middle schools connecticut and i'm here with my gaslight detection project using tiny ml so why do we use an oil tank? So that might be a big question to some of you who doesn't have an oil tank. So basically, I live in northeast part of America, and it gets very cold, especially during the winter months in the area. So it is very important for our house to be heated up. For the newer houses, they have different types of technology to heat up your house. But for the older houses and apartments, one of the most common ways to heat up your house is to use a boiler heating system. But how does an oil tank have to do with any of this? So what an oil tank does is it stores the diesel and propane fuel and using the boiler heating system, it will uh, burn the fuel and that's what helps heat your home. So I've explained that the oil tank plays a really big role in heating up your house but there are also some obstacles that you have to face. So every year, inspectors come to our house to check if our oil tank and boiler is working properly, but that's a one year span. What if something happens in between then? And the basement is not a place where you go in that often. So the only times you might go is when there's a problem. So if there are any cracks or holes inside your, in your oil tank, then gradually it would grow and it could um, catch on fire, but that's least likely because diesel fuel does not catch on fire that easily, but still it's a chance. And also um, it poses a really big health issue to household members, such as humans and also pets. And that in one of the biggest things is it can contaminate water supply not just your water supply, but also your neighbor's water supply. And probably insurance might not cover that. And also it increases the repair cost than just regular maintenance. But what if you could be able to detect that earlier? It would reduce your health issues for any humans or pets. The re it could reduce risk of contamination and reduce the risk of cost. So it would just be a regular maintenance cost. But the thing is, how can we detect? So diesel and propane has different smell than anything else, probably. So you should smell the air and identify if it is diesel or propane. And then you should send a text or notification to homeowner's mobile phone. So my smart oil leak detection project does just that. So it has a multi-channel gas sensor and that will collect the smell from the air. My microcontroller will run on tiny amount to um, distinguish the smell. And then um, it will send an alert to my Blink app um, if there's diesel detected in the air. So why did I choose machine learning over um, regular ethos logics? So if, so if you see in the 
um, diagram below. So um, it is showing two ways to make chicken dinner. So basically, if you're doing traditional programming, you, you have the input and you have to uh, write the list of how to make it. And then the traditional, like, it will just make it for you, the output. But if you're doing the machine learning algorithm, you just give the inputs and what you expect of it. And the machine learning algorithm will figure out what the steps are to make it. But how does this relate to my project? So basically for the gas, if, if you're using the traditional programming, you're going to have to write like a hundred different if else logics. But if you use the machine learning algorithm, instead of having to do all that hassle, you can just uh, leave it to the algorithm and it will figure that out for you if you just get the inputs and the outputs. So I'm going to give my demo of my project. So basically I have a little container of diesel and I'm going to put it next to my device. And right now it's saying it's a leakage because it's smelling the diesel. Now, when I pull it away, what it should say is it should go back to normal in a couple of seconds. Yes, so you can see there, um, it turned back to normal because it couldn't smell the diesel anymore. So now let's jump into what I've actually put into that. So I have used the seed Studio Wii Terminal, which you could have seen um, on the front of my device. I have used a Grove multi-channel gas sensor, which is smelling the air. Then I'm using a five volt mini fan, which will help circulate the air. In a 3D printed case, that's optional, but if you want to make your device look more slick and probably unique, then you could add that. So I also have the software. So I'm using Edge Impulse Studio, um, Arduino IDE, which is where I'm going to uh, put all my coding and using the Blink app for my notifications. So I've explained that I've used Edge Impulse to, um, so I've used Edge Impulse. So the reason why I use Edge Impulse is because I'm going to be building my model using that. So I'm going to show you step-by-step step how to make your own model. So first things first, you need to collect your data in order to train it. So you need to collect your data from the air, the smell of it, and then you need to create the impulse. So in the image to the left, I have my um, example of my impulse. So in the first block, it has the time series data. So like, the two points that are mainly there, so the window size and the window increase. So basically the window size is how much uh, data it's going to get for each classification. And then for uh, the window increase, it's like a window, like a, sh a sliding window. So if the actual sample of your data is bigger than your window size, then it will be like um, shifting it, like, so it will be like a sliding window for um, how many milliseconds after it should take my data. And then for the raw data, it's um, showing the four different channels for the gas. And then for the neural network, uh, Karis, I'm, I'm still learning about this because I'm still not sure about it. Yeah, so. That's the beauty of using a tool like Edge Impulse, right? Yeah. Because you are not data scientist, even I'm not a data scientist, yes. but uh, we have the idea and using a smart tool like this, like uh, all the data scientists and experts are building this kind of tools so that uh, people like us can actually bring our ideas to life, right? So that's exactly. the whole point of using a smart tool like uh, Edge Impulse. So yeah, yeah. so you're still learning, but you, you can still use a tool like uh, Edge Impulse and uh, you can bring your ideas and implement that and actually uh, make good, good use of that. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, so exactly. And then you, so then the next step, you need to define your uh, neural network architecture. So basically you'll have your training settings. 
in that. And then last thing, you just train it. So um, after you have like a good sample of data and your training is working properly like you should, then you move on to the next step, which is to deploy the TinyML onto the Weird Terminal. So now your model, you finish the model. So now you just download that as a zip file. Then you import it to your Arduino IDE, which is where you're doing the programming. Then you upload your sketch as unoptimized, as you see in the image to the left. I'm choosing unoptimized because that still fits for my microcontroller. All right, so for the Eon tuner, so basically two slides ago, I was um, explaining how I was defining the neural network architecture. So basically what my problem was with the raw data when I was testing it, it was working almost perfect. But then when I was training with the live data, it was a uh, very poor. So what Eon Tuner does is um, it, it helps to improve your model. So it will check your um, architecture it will check all the possible architectures you can have, and it will suggest you different types. So Eon Tuner suggested um, spectral analysis instead of uh, the raw data. Yep. Yeah, and the thing was um, using raw data to train, it was doing very, it wasn't doing so good, but when it was uh, training with the live data, it was working almost perfectly. So that's how Eon Tuner helped me. So the other challenges that I faced. So what I've so the oil tank that I have in my house, it's an indoor oil tank, but there are also outdoor oil tanks that can um, be underground or in your yard or somewhere outside, like said in the name. So basically, I couldn't be able to do the outdoor oil tank because, first of all, I don't have one. But my prediction is it will be a little more difficult to test for an outdoor oil tank because um, it would mix in with the smells from outside. And also if it's underground, then the smell like it could, the ground would absorb like the smell or something. So this is just my opinion, I'm not sure, but if I can be able to do an outdoor oil tank prediction, then I will see about that. But this is my prediction for now. And when I was testing my um, indoor oil tank, so there are lots of smells from the kitchen because the basement is um, directly under our kitchen. So whenever there's any cooking happening, it, it would get some smell and it would class it would misclassify from the other smells. So that's one challenge that I have to face. And also um, you had to collect a lot of data in order for it to be really accurate. And I had to circulate the air before when I didn't have the fan, um, we, we didn't have the right data because it wasn't accurate enough. But when we started like fanning it, we realized that the air wasn't being circulated enough. So that's why we have added a fan yeah. to it instead. So that helped our purposes much more. So any questions? Uh, yeah. I think there is only one you can click on the Q&A section. Sorry. Oops. <laughs> Okay, I have a one question for you, Shahrika. Do, you, uh, do uh, did, did you have any plans to like to deploy it? No, no, no. I mean, like, uh, do you have any future plan to uh, improve this project or like to apply it into other scenarios? Because, like, I think uh, the the tech behind every different applications are uh, quite the same, right? To be honest, like, but uh, if you are deploying it into different scenario scenarios, you can like uh, uh, leverage its function. I think. So, do you have any other plans like this? 
Yeah, so basically, um, like I said, if I could be able to uh, do outdoor oil tank, I would, but right now I don't have any access to that, but anything else. So what do you think? I honestly think like. Yeah, from, first of all, like you have to secure your home. Yes. Right? So the idea is to put that thing uh, always on in our basement, right? So that's yeah. the first thing and make sure like it does the right thing. And then uh, definitely if there is any opportunity, um, to use the same uh, technology in, to solve similar kind of problem as you were saying, Tilly. So definitely we we'll look for that. And also as um, Sashika was mentioning, like uh, during, so this is just a proof of concept, right? And uh, she faced a lot of challenges uh, regarding uh, data classification, like uh, as she was mentioning, like uh, we have kitchen just top of our basement. So sometimes um, uh, kitchen smell comes yeah. So we trained, um, like uh, we, we did, uh, we went through a lot of iteration, collect uh, different uh, variety of data, and then finally we came to this um, thing. And also Ion Tuner helped a lot uh, there with the raw data classification. It was really good on paper, like uh, it was saying almost 100%, right? Yeah. And then, it, but when we deployed on the microcontroller, it was not doing the uh, right thing. Yeah. And then uh, we used Ion Tuner and uh, the suggestion was to use Spectrum network uh, rather than raw data. But that uh, DSP actually helped us. And now on paper, uh, like accuracy it's is not that almost, good. It's almost perfect when using when deploy, live data. Yeah. But yeah, to answer your question, definitely we look forward to other use cases. Yeah. That would be great. Okay, I think we got another question. Like, uh, how long does it take to for you to code for this the whole project? Yeah. So basically, in order to code the whole thing, mm -hmm. uh, that took us around like few weeks. Yeah, it took us a few weeks to actually get everything right. Because when you're coding, it doesn't just work in like one like in the first try. You always got to like there will be some mistakes that you make and then you will have to go back and fix them. And then it will be like a cycle until you think you got something right and pretty mm -hmm. decent looking to you and you like that product. So mm -hmm. yeah. It's and on the, really also accuracy of your Exactly, prediction. yeah. So not just um, the coding of it, but also just like classifying itself yeah. what took us a little time. Right. Mm, awesome. I think you, you also make it into a process of learning. That's good. And then also, uh, I think there is a very interesting question, Papa, like, uh, Shashirika, did you feel like you, you were more like a scientist or an engineer? <coughs> How would you call yourself <laughs> in the role of this project? Honestly, I don't know. Uh... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I honestly have no idea like yeah. what I would call but myself but yeah I'm, I'm a learner that's that's what I can say for sure I don't know about either of those but right now I'm a learner like, awesome yeah awesome thank you so much uh, I think um, Mason you can start your sharing now and then if you have uh, more questions of uh, for Shashirika's project and then you can always find her um, like we, uh, Mason will share the, their contacts, and then uh, you can also talk about your follow up questions at like Tiny ML Forum. So, Mason, the yep. floor is yours. Yeah, so you can. Yeah, I'll move, I'll move it. Okay. So, hi, uh, hi guys, uh, thanks for joining. Uh, uh, as you know, my name is Mason Das, uh, I'm a software engineer uh, by profession. And uh, we both are learning, honestly. Um, so I'm learning and I'm basically teaching her. So this is how things are going um, in our house. So yeah. I don't think I'm a, I'm not data scientist. Like, as I said, like we both are learning, but I'm a software engineer. I can write code and I can write applications, a uh, little bit of embedded as well, but no means I'm a data scientist. But uh, so basically that's the beauty of these um, tools and we have a lot of experts out there, right? So they are uh, trying their level based, like very hard to create a tools like Edge Impulse and there are um, some other tools as well. 
which you can use, like you have idea, you can use that easily, you can collect some data and then you can build your model without knowing so much in detail about that and then get your uh, model deployed on microcontrollers or single board computer like that. So that's how I started because uh, machine learning is a very advanced topic, but uh, it's very interesting as well. Like when you think about it, um, as uh, Sasika was mentioning, like it's different from traditional programming. Like in traditional programming, you basically write your own algorithm, like with if fails, like if A get than B, and then that should happen. And but in, yeah. There, there's more of a chance to make mistakes. Right. And with um, just like using the machine learning algorithm, it's easier to find your mistakes and like yeah. less possibilities. Exactly. And yeah, so basically in machine learning, it's basically all about making sense of the data, right? So you have a lot of data these days. You have a lot of uh, advanced sensors like um, images, uh, thermal cameras, a uh, lot of other sensors which collects different gases, the one uh, Sashika used. So you have different data and then you know based on what situation that result is coming, right? So now you can actually use that input and you know the output and then you can actually uh, build your algorithm and that's your machine learning model, right? So using that concept, uh, you can do, you can solve a lot of different things. So one interesting problem I was solving, like we both, uh, like uh, me, my daughter and my wife, we like we like to uh, camp and a lot of people around the East Coast, we love to camp because summer is very short, right? So we want to utilize the summer months. Um, but one problem is that like, um, if you are uh, camping in wild, we Usually don't do, we don't uh, camp in the wild. Normally we take some safe places, but there are a lot of people who actually uh, camp in wild. And the problem there is that in the night when it's dark, you can't really see anything. And if there is any wild animal approaching, uh, you will not get any idea. And all of a sudden you will realize like um, they are like in front of your tent, right? So if there is any alert system which can help uh, even like uh, apart from uh, animals like there could be some human like with bad intention right um they can come close to your tent and then who knows uh but the problem is that during night uh, you cannot use image classification and object detection thing because you can't see anything it's totally dark so how are you going to solve that problem so there are um, options like you can put a pir uh, sensor which can sense something but uh that's not very effective way to do that. Um, it don't work from our distance and there are some challenges as well. Then um, um, I, I um, got this one. Uh, I was doing some research about thermal imaging and I thought this could solve my problem because uh, this camera is not a visual camera, like not a, like a typical camera, but it can sense the temperature. So, um, so based on that, I basically uh, created a system which can work in the night and it can detect uh, animal or human and then it can actually uh, send alert. So you now uh, I'm going to uh, take a little deeper dive here. Um, so the hardware I have used is same as Sasika did, uh, is Uyo terminal. And then I have used group uh, thermal imaging camera. And uh, probably you can see on the picture, like uh, there is a, a little uh, black circle. So that's the camera inside. So I printed that uh, enclosure. And uh, I'm using LoRa one GPS chassis. Um, I'll talk about that, like how I came here. Uh, basically I have gone through multiple iteration of these projects. And uh, definitely a battery chassis because when you are camping, probably you are not going to plug to your arm. Uh, wall socket there's probably no wall yeah, sockets exactly. out in the wild and now um the software um yeah again i have used age impulse um arduino ide uh amazon web services aws um people know that better uh, and helium um basically helium console um to register your device so that you can use the lower network basically helium network um to transmit the data to aws cloud and then uh, Telegram bot, um, I did not build my own uh, app. I just use Telegram. So from AWS uh, Lambda, it can actually send a notification to my uh, Telegram bot. 
Yeah, so now the interesting part is the data collection. Now uh, imagine like uh, when you are doing a typical uh, image classification, like you have images and then you basically extract the feature based on um, different things as you know, and then uh, we can classify the images. But here, uh, thermal camera is a little different. Um, it does not have a image kind of thing, but rather what we have is basically raw data of uh, temperatures. So what I did, uh, basically this idea is not my own idea. Like uh, there is another guy, uh, I'm happy to uh, name him. Like uh, there is a, a community expert uh, called Naveen Kumar. And he basically did that uh, something um, which basically caught my eyes. And I took the idea from him actually, um, how to represent uh, this thermal, uh, thermal image as a CSV format. So I did that. Um, so data is collected from the view terminal as CSV file. And as you can see on the top of the uh, screen, like that's the CSV data. So all data, each data is basically a thermal representation and the length of the data is 768. So basically 32 by 24. So that's the number of arrays um, the thermal uh, sensor camera holds. So that's the represent representation of the whole data. And then um, I basically uploaded that data to my computer and then I uh, transformed that to a JSON file and then uploaded to Edge Impulse using uh, Edge Impulse forwarder. And also uh, just for my own visualization, what I did basically I converted that uh, CSV data to image so that you can actually see what you have captured and whether you captured the right thing. So that's uh, the picture uh, on the left with a blue background. So that was a person um, um, sitting uh, somewhere and um, that's the CSV data on top and that's the visual representation of that data. And then uh, this is how it looks uh, on Edge Impulse. Um, so when, so basically, uh, it's, as I said, it's 32 by 24 array of sensor values. Um, so total uh, 768. And thing is that Edge Impulse uh, can handle uh, only time series raw data, right? So what uh, I did is basically sending uh, 760 uh, raw data in an interval of one microsecond. So you can see like it's seven, um, 768 microsecond and is one chunk of data uh, with uh, seven, um, 768 different uh, values. So this is how um, the data is actually represented. Um, it's, it looks like a raw data, uh, but actually imagine like it's, it was an image and then thermal camera took that image, which is basically a lot of uh, like uh, uh, thermal values. And then that uh, data is represented as a raw data here. So yeah, it was, it was quite fascinating to work on this um, kind of project. And remember um, that day, like when I had microwaved that bagel, like um, you were testing it out and it had showed the bagel, right. like that hot bagel, like yeah. in the camera. Like Exactly. So basically, uh, exactly. So the same technology uh, when uh, I was working on that, then we realized there are a lot of applications uh, which can use exact same kind of uh, technology. So for example, uh, if your stove is on and you basically uh, went to bed in the night, right? That happens a uh, few times in our house. So you can use similar kind of technology. You can put that uh, in front of the um, stove somewhat like uh, some distance and it can actually sense because uh, it doesn't matter whether it's dark or bright, uh, it only senses the heat. So, and then, uh, so that's the basic thing about machine learning part. And then I deployed onto uh, your terminal and then I started testing it. My initial version of this project was uh, using Wi-Fi. And so using Wi-Fi, it was sending the data to AWS cloud. And then from there, I was sending notification to uh, Telegram. But soon I realized, uh, if I have to actually take it to the campground, probably I won't have a Wi-Fi connection. And the only way I can make it work is basically connect that to my uh, phone's Wi-Fi. And that's not a very uh, good solution in my opinion. Then I started thinking about it and then realized probably uh, 
LoRa, LoRa would be a better choice instead of going to Wi-Fi. So then uh, in the next iteration, I introduce uh, LoRa one, and uh, I'm a big fan of Helium, by the way. Um, so I've been uh, working with Helium like uh, since um long time, basically. So I have done a lot of projects on Helium, and this one is one of them. And I chose Helium because I already have a Helium hotspot at home. I can test it out quickly. And uh, the Helium network is growing, right? It's growing very rapidly. So that's a very wise decision to use Helium um, when you're talking about LoRa network. So yeah, and uh, I use uh, Seed uh, LoRa one chassis, which has GPS as well. So now I can actually take it to the wild where we, where we have uh, Helium network coverage, probably like it's growing very rapidly. In few years, probably will have Helium coverage almost everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, so that was the whole project. And then um, I basically created, uh, I registered that device on Helium console. I created the integration point uh, so that the data from Helium can uh, go to AWS. Uh, if you need more information about that, you can just check out uh, Helium. You can log into Helium console, create your account, and uh, try it out. They have very good documentation uh, how to integrate uh, with AWS, not only just AWS, with different other systems like uh, Microsoft Azure or MQTT, even HTTP. So they have nice uh, documentation. You, you should check it out if you are interested. And uh, yeah, and then uh, regarding AWS, like I'm not going to take a deep dive on AWS. Um, this is not an AWS course or AWS training, but I have used uh, AWS IoT. And then, uh, so Helium basically sends the data to AWS IoT topic. And then I have a Lambda, which actually listens to the topic. And then it basically sends the data to, sends the notification to my Telegram app. So um, that's all about my project. Uh, so I did not take a very deep dive about my project because it was all about uh, my daughter's uh, presentation today. But yeah, if you have any uh, any further questions or if you want to reach out to me or Sashrika, um, there are uh, some uh, connection points. Like you can reach out to me via Hackster, uh, Twitter, LinkedIn, or uh, you can email me as well. Mm -hmm. And now- Mithun, I think there is a question about helium. Like, is helium available in the areas like jungles or mountains? Uh, it, it actually depends. I would not say it's available everywhere right now, but mm -hmm. with the speed um, helium is growing, uh, who knows, maybe in next five, 10 years, we'll have helium connection almost everywhere. And imagine like uh, there are a lot of uh, like, uh, uh, what should I say, like uh, uh, environmental uh, uh, enthusiasts and uh, people who actually um, think about uh, wild animals. So they are thinking about putting heliums in those uh, remote places um, so that we can deploy uh, some smart uh, devices uh, uh, to track our wild animals and activities. So probably, uh, in wild, we'll have helium in future. I won't say it's available right now, but maybe in future, yes. Uh, okay, awesome. Okay, uh, I also got one more like follow up question for Shashrika. Like, is the oil tank detection project based, like, operated by batteries? And how is it be charged? That? All right, so basically uh, for my weird terminal, it has a battery chasis. So um, basically you can charge that and then like, should I like show them or? Yeah, and that's the battery chasis, yeah. you can definitely show. Yeah, I'm going to show them the battery chasis. So this is the weird terminal battery chasis. I was actually just charging this in case. So basically if you charge this, then put it like behind the weird terminal, then it will be charged. So you can just charge this and, it'll, and it should be all good to go. And also like uh, probably like uh, even if you charge it, like yeah. uh, it will stay for a uh, few hours, right? And you can tune your program so that it can yeah. go longer. But at some point you have to recharge it. Yeah. So the either option, if you are putting in your basement, like the one we are doing it, so in basement, we have the wall socket, right? We uh, connect to the wall, so it's always uh, powered. But if you're uh, planning to put it outdoor, then probably you should look for some uh, solar thing. 
So uh, I did that uh, similar kind of project in my uh, camper. So uh, check out my uh, hackster uh, where I actually implemented uh, uh, solar power. So <clears throat> it actually um, gets the power from um, solar energy and it can run like longer. Like maybe in the night, um, like in the morning, it will get charged from uh, solar and then it can work in the night like that. But yeah, like, but just for this one, uh, you need to uh, think about uh, continuous power supply or something different. Mm, awesome. Thank you so much for the detailed explanation. To be honest, I personally myself have another question, like, because like I am a, I have been pay, paying a lot of like attentions to STEAM educations. I think the way you are like, helping or like guiding Shashirika learning about all this is quite very interesting. And then uh, could you give us some tips how you can like uh, lead the kit, like a kit like Shashirika to learn about like IOTs or technologies, any, any tips? Yeah, yeah, that? definitely, definitely. Uh -huh. So basically the way it started because um, Sashika saw me working with uh, IoT stuff. So mm -hmm. like usually if you think about programming, so kids, they don't get much excited about programming because they see yeah. that dad is working on laptop and doing something and she has no clue, and right? Very complicated looking, probably very boring to them. Yeah, and then when she saw me working with some IoT stuff, like physical things, like uh, something is moving, something is actually happening. So that uh, that thing actually got her uh, interested in that. And um, then we have been thinking like how we should start. Then one thing we started is basically a thing called Scratch. Exactly. Yeah, so basically what Scratch is, it's like a website that you can be able to code your own games. Right. So basically uh, there will be these characters that you can add in using block coding. You can be able to drag the blocks and you can make your own um, game in. Right. Yeah. So that's how she started because game is something um, uh, every kid gets excited about. And, and also like I had this book that you had a bunch of different games that you can program. So yeah, like um, my dad said, um, kids get really excited when they think of video games or some sort of games. So if you can make your own game, that's like the coolest thing ever. So if you like have the book, you can like see through that and then you can make your own. So mm -hmm. that's like very simple. Yeah. Very and good then, way to start. So that was the first thing we started. So uh, we would highly recommend that. So go, go slow, right? Uh, yeah. Take one step at a time. Don't try to introduce everything to the kid at, at once. <laughs> Rather take a small steps. Uh, so Scratch is very nice way to start for the kids. They will get excited. And then the next thing we did is basically microbit, right? Yeah. So uh, we got microbit uh, with the with the whole kit, and she started learning because it's easy to get started. Um, you can um, use the code, block coding. Yeah, and, you not just block coding, but after you master the block coding, you can go into different uh, two other languages, Python and JavaScript. Right. So you can like um level up. Yeah. And now uh, the good thing about that, uh, you, you saw you use that uh, it's, um, that application, right? CodeCraft. Oh yeah. Yeah. So CodeCraft uh, is another uh, tool. Uh, I think uh, closely worked with uh, Seed uh, View Terminal, and uh, you can use the block coding. So that's kind of like if you have some knowledge of block coding from scratch, then you can actually use the same um, same learning and use um, CodeCraft to actually um, create your machine learning model using edge impulse and then deploy directly to your view terminal using block coding. So that will be a very easy for kids and highly recommended. Mm, awesome. Yeah. That's cool. Thank you so much for sharing. I think uh, we are pretty much of the, the Q&A session and then uh, all, to all the audience, if you are having more follow-up questions for Shashrika or Mithun, please go to our Tiny Mail forum where we will post all the slides today and also including the video links as well. So you can ask Mithun over there. And then uh, 
also, you can also contact these two speakers through the contacts listed here on the screen now. So thank you so much again to Mithun and Sasharika for like for this meaningful sharing. And last but not least, we also would love to express our gratitude to our TinyML Talk strategy partners again. And first to our exclusive strategy partners. Arm, Edge Impulse, the leading edge uh, machine learning platform. Qualcomm, advancing AI research to make uh, efficient AI ubiquitous. And then Centalian, end-to-end deep learning solution for TinyML and Edge AI. And then also to our Platinum strategy partners, DeepLive, fattest video analysis solution on ARM CPUs. Click Attack, global IoT solutions. And Reality AI, adding advanced sensing to your product with Edge AI Tiny ML. And Renaissance, broad and scalable edge computing portfolio. And then also, we also wanted to send our growth strategy partners for TinyML Talks. PhotoHub, Methane Integrated, Methane Integrated Enabling Edge Intelligence. Lantern AI, Adaptive AI for the Intelligent Edge. Micro.ai, NSP, and then also SEED, deploying TinyML into the real world, plug and play machine learning. Sensei ML, uh, build small IoT sensor device from data. And then also ST, SingSense. And then also to our Silver strategy partner, Aeon device, Amazon, Great Waves Technology, Gravity, HOTG, Imagine Mob, Etimers, Prosophy, Quizzle, Reason, SAP, and String Analyze. And then a reminder here for our next TinyML Talks. If you are interested into Autoflow, an open source framework to automatically implement neutral network on embedded device. Don't miss out this talk. It will happen on April 5th, presented by Daniel and Marcus. And then that's all. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Mithun and Sasharika. Thank you so much. <laughs>